Hey, can you hear me through this microphone? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today for the in person option uh, for representing disability after CODA. Uh, my name is Michelle Liu Carriger, and I am a professor of theater and performance studies here in the Department of Theater. Uh, I have long hair. It's like longer than usual because of COVID. Um, it's blue at the ends and it's gray at the top. And I'm wearing a colorful big sleeve uh, blouse, velvet pants, and um, one of my favorite pair of glitter shoes. So I teach a couple of classes here at UCLA in which we consider representations of disability and the accessibility of theater. And what has really struck me over the years of teaching these kinds of classes is how much and how rapidly the activism and the expectations about responsible representations are changing. And so changes in the best practices in theater and representation seem to be getting faster and faster. Um, I'm always thrilled to be in the room when people are thinking hard about how performance and representation works and how we might want to work, uh, make it work differently or better. And I want to see our forms of art get better, more sensitive, more diverse, and more ethical all the time. Um, but I also see that this is a struggle. There's really a struggle to understand and improve representation. Um, and that struggle gets fraught, it gets uncomfortable and upsetting. So just this year, the theater department has produced two plays which highlighted the complexities of the ethics of representation. In She Kills Monsters, a play by Queen Nguyen, a literally kick-ass warrior woman is revealed halfway through the play um, to be the role-playing game avatar of a character with a physical disability. And in another play this year, uh, the story is told from the perspective of the mother of a neurodivergent child. So up until pretty recently, um, the popular consensus would probably say that this is great that we have representations of characters with disabilities or neurodivergence, um, but maybe didn't think through all the ramifications of who plays that character, how they do it, or the fact that many of these stories constantly recenter the perspectives of neurotypical or able-bodied people. But thanks to growing activism, and awareness around the power uh, and normative propensities of representation, theater and performance makers are learning how to think and act beyond whether we have characters with disabilities to how we are creating more access and awareness at all levels of production and story. And so this panel today is one uh, moment in our continuing to try to be better about this. Um, creating theater, creating a theater that is more and more accessible open, diverse, and sensitive is everyone's responsibility. And so this panel is geared toward opening up that conversation and hopefully beginning longer, sustained dialogue and attention to these issues. As we in the UCLA Department of Theater continue striving to, as the motto goes, create what's next. This has to be a long-term project. And I'm proud to announce um, a couple upcoming additional events in TFT's attention to disability and accessibility issues. So on May 26th, there is going to be an instructor's workshop for building better accessibility into classes uh, about disability justice in our teaching in classes. It's co-facilitated by members of Sins Invalid and the One in Four uh, Coalition. And I was told last night um, that I can also announce that the commencement speaker for this year's TFT graduation will be Troy Kotzer, the deaf actor who won the best supporting Oscar uh, this year for CODA. So please stay tuned, get involved in these issues in changing representation for the better with us here in the Department of Theater and the School of Theater, Film and Television. So thanks for joining us today. This event is just act one in what I hope will be many more events in which we concentrate on these issues. So I'm going to pass it off to our co-moderators, Elizabeth Guffey and Hans Vermey. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Hans Vermey. Uh, I'm an adjunct here and uh, very excited to be a co-moderator on this panel, which is what my whole little introduction is about. Is this, is this working here? Thank you. Uh, as a survivor of AIDS and a person living with HIV for over 20 years and living with a family member diagnosed with MS, 
my life in social constructions of disability have circular, circulated around later in life diagnoses. But my scholarship and interest in the crossroads of theater and performance and disability studies came about when I was working on cognitive neuroscience in performance. And that field kept slipping into these, <clears throat> kept slipping into using these tools of examining cognition and brain activity to find universal patterns across uh, thought, processes of thought, reception, and perception, leading us into universalizing culture and cultural performance. And this universalizing of human perception and reception and culture was challenged by my students with autism who wanted to use the theater to build spaces and performances for new ways of perceiving, thinking, and sharing in reception that could affect scientific models for studying the brain by changing the social sphere. Greatly inspired, I've continued to uh, work to advocate for autist representation, collaboration, and leadership in uh, theater. And here at UCLA, I've been working with students on approaching policy for disability in institutional performance. And so this is extremely exciting for me. This is where I want to be right now at a panel on this topic uh, with these three great speakers and my co-moderator, Elizabeth Guffey, whose book, Designing Disability, Symbols, Space, uh, and Society, is not to be missed. Uh, it's a really great read and it kept me turning the pages. I've never finished a scholarly book so quickly. <clears throat> Stephanie Lim's uh, work uh, drew my attention as an Angelino writing on Deaf West Theater and East West Players. And I'm really excited to be sitting next to Vicki Lewis, who's really an inspiring uh, leader in disability and performance scholarship. Uh, but I also read a great forward by you in a book that I use a lot called The Autistic Stage, How Cognitive Disability Changed 20th Century Performance um, by Arundel. In anticipation uh, of this panel, I also got my hands on a copy of Leroy Moore's Black Cripple Delivers Poetry and Lyrics. I just got it a month ago. It has left my house. It traded five hands and I had to go to Glendale yesterday to get back. <laughs> Uh, and I, I do have some favorites in here that if I, hopefully I'll get any time afterwards, I'll show them to you. Uh, and with that, yeah, I would like to pass it off to my co-moderator. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess this is working. I'm Elizabeth Guffey, and we were just for the, tell you the format of this panel, uh, we'll just self-introduce for a moment or two, and then um, that is the two of us. And then we're gonna go to our panelists and let them tell you a little bit about themselves and also their engagement with the topic. So just as background, yes, um, I write as a scholar. Um, I'm also, um, just for access purposes, a white woman with short brown hair and I'm wearing a blue dress and wearing glasses. Um, I write about uh, especially access and disability. I also do some public scholarship too um, and have written in places like the New York Times and the Nation about access. Um, but I'm really here today and most interested um, as co-convener of the Disability Studies Initiative up at UCSB. I am a professor at State University of New York and I'm also a visiting professor here in disability studies. So um, without really going into much more about myself though, I think I really wanna turn over to the great group of panelists that we have here. And I think we'll just go one by one. If you could each introduce yourselves and also just give the audience a little bit of a sense of what your engagement with the topic is, that would be great. I'll turn it over to you, Leroy. Hello, Leroy Moore. I'm a black man wearing um, a white hoodie and a brown um, jacket with um, some khakis. And I have the gray hair because I'm getting old. Um, so my work, I'm, I'm, I'm a graduate student here. First year under um, anthropology and linguistics. Um, my my work deals with um, a lot of things, race, disability, but lately it's on um, hot nation. And uh, my PhD goal is that we're going to um, establish what's called the Clip Institute in LA um, 
to bring culture, activism, hip hop in the tech together in one place. Um, this is gonna happen before the Olympics come and take over LA. <laughs> so that's that's our goal. And we um, won a, 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 in any last year for the movie Rising Phoenix. So. Hi everyone, um, I'm Stephanie Lim. I am a sixth year uh, PhD student at UC Irvine. I'm actually finishing in the next three weeks, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> I also teach at Cal State Northridge. That's primarily uh, what I'm doing right now and besides <laughs> dissertation writing, of course. And um, what brings me to this event is, is uh, my dissertation research, which is on performances of music in American Sign Language. I look at uh, different mediums, so television, music videos, and musical theater, and theater being my primary interest. Um, as a theater performance person, I'm especially interested in the ways that uh, sign language and deaf music moves uh, or, or transfers. Um, I guess let me go back for a second. Um, because a lot of the popular performances of American Sign Language music are adaptations or covers of existent work. Um, I'm, I'm primarily interested in the ways that shifts occur, right? So the ways that uh, a song is taken from its original sort of non-deaf or hearing version into its deaf version. Um, and then I'm looking especially at the ways that television or music video or theater, those different aesthetics um, and different elements of those mediums, uh, how they stage deaf identity or stage deaf, the, the deaf body in different ways. Um, oh, sorry, self description. I'm, I'm a Asian woman with short black hair. I'm wearing a, what am I wearing? A white and blue checkered uh, button up. Um, I think that was it, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Vicki Lewis and um, I'm a, uh, uh, white woman in late middle age, let's put it that way, uh, with brown hair and I'm wearing a black uh, suit jacket and a uh, red and maroon striped shirt, which I bought just for this event. <laughs> and um, I, uh, uh, I'm wearing glasses and, uh, uh, and I, I just thought I'd mention, I put this pin on especially for today, and it, because it was given to me by Susan Nussbaum. And Susan is a, one of the great, great playwrights um, and great activists. Um, uh, she's a poet, as one of my colleagues from the Mark Taper Forum where I worked for many years, she's a poet warrior. And her work is really wonderful and it should be produced. And I wanna encourage everybody to look. Uh, John Beluso is also a great writer that we, um, that died very early. Um, and these, when we get to the question about what can we do, there's many, many different kinds of performance, but Susan's work, um, she brought uh, wit. Um, she's the Jonathan Swift of the disability uh, culture. And I just taught Jonathan Swift to a whole lot of business majors. And I know they're gonna remember it when they're on, Je on Jeopardy. <laughs> um, uh, but um, she just died and it was a shock and none of us expected it. But she gave me this pin and this pin was, it's. Um, uh, 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 it, um, Elizabeth, so this is a, another, like an abstract version of the wheelchairs that you talk a lot about you spend, and images that you spend a lot of time with. And, um, uh, and in the middle of it, it says, in the middle of the wheel, it says, gimps drool, but the D is crossed out. And so it reads, gimps rule. And um, this is Anna Stoneham, who was uh, the wife of Mike Irvin, who was another great playwright. Um, he's still with us, another comic writer. Um, and uh, Anna Stoneham did really great visual work. Um, she, have you ever seen the poster of the evolution? And it starts with uh, uh, an, an, an ape and it goes up the hill and we get all the way to walking man, right? But that's not the top of the hill. The top of the hill is a person in a wheelchair. So that is turning the whole, you know, the, the, uh, the disability benefit comes as opposed to seeing it as a deficit. Um, 
so that's that. Um, I got in, I, my mother and father were both performers. And though I got polio, for some reason, my mother gave me singing lessons and dance lessons. And, um, uh, and um, but when I went um, to get theater training, I was turned down from a very prestigious school in New York City. I was told I would never work because I didn't use a chair at that time. I just had a limp and um, a weird leg. And they said, you would never work. We won't train you. And, uh, uh, and um, so I ended up uh, going through the back door um, and, and working with, uh, disabled, with, with collectives. And that was my training. I worked with two theater collectives that came out of the People's Theater Movement back in the day, you know, back um, on the West Coast. And, um, and then uh, and then the disability rights movement came along and children of a lesser God came along. And I ended up being an artist in residence at the theater that developed children of a lesser God. However complicated our current reading is of that play, it was still pretty exciting. And the reason I got that job, and I'll stop here, um, is that the Marte perform, yes, you got, at least I, I say this anywhere else and they think it's a paper company, but, um, uh, but it's the big theater downtown. And, um, they were showing Children of a Lesser God, and they've developed 200 subscribing deaf and hard of hearing audience members. So it was a huge deal, also for disabled people. But disabled people, mobility impaired people can get in the theater because it was inaccessible. And 504 had already been passed. And, um, uh, and they were embarrassed, the theater, right? So I came along with this little grant and all they, for disabled women, and all they had to do was take a door off of one of the women's stalls and put me in a rehearsal room crummy rehearsal room, like any rehearsal room, you know, the coffee machine stank and the linoleum was broken up, but that's where John Malkovich and Alan Alda and these, and Atoll Fugard uh, uh, had, uh, and all of August Wilson's plays got produced there as well. They weren't developed there, but they got produced. So that was where we rehearsed. And, um, and I ended up being there for 20 years and developing documentary plays and teaching acting to disabled uh, men and women at, and of all different. Uh, intersectional wasn't the word there, but we were, because we were in LA, we had a very diverse group and that changed. And, um, and then I came here and uh, had five of the most wonderful years of my life getting a PhD in theater. And, um, and I got to broaden my wings and most of my scholarship now deals with weaving disability arts into the theater history narrative that really bring our voices in there. So that's kind of what I do. And, um, and I worked with Brooke on a show uh, uh, developing, it was based on the congressional records for the first meet meeting on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I did it here and everybody becomes a Senator and a Congressman and a disabled grassroots person and Judy Human, you know, but three people wanted to be Judy Human, So she became a choir. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, so uh, I'm the oldest person here, I think in this panel. Uh, and what is thrilling to me is to be with these um, younger, people who are continuing and bringing the work forward and um, and that UCLA is doing this and all of the work that's gonna get done here, all of it um, is, I'm just very proud. I'm very proud to be a Bruin, so yeah, that's it. Well, that's a great way of seeking into um, our first question. And, and let me just say the format here is that I'll ask a question um, and to the panelists, and Hans will also, but we really do want to open up the floor to uh, as well and get feedback from the audience too. So um, I'm just going to ask one question uh, right now, um, but hold yours soon because we're eager for feedback. So we're my question, and I guess this really seeks off of what you're just saying right now, Vicky, is I think we're in a curious moment. Uh, CODAS just recently triumphed at the Academy Awards. But that achievement really seems to mark a whole bunch of newer questions too. And um, you know, we've at, we're at this moment where there's a lot of discussion of race, representations of that, sexuality, sexual orientation, gender. But we don't publicly hear a lot about disability and the various implications there are for representation, um, not just actually having disabled people um, 
portrayed, although that in itself is an issue. But then who gets to do that kind of representation? What sort of work is being done there too? Just don't hear much about it. And at, yet at the same time, you could argue that disabled people are proportionally probably one of the largest underrepresented groups there is. So I guess I'm gonna turn that question over to the people on the panel, because I'm curious what your feedback is. Why do you think that this is a question that really hasn't been dealt with that directly and still, even in spite of this moment of CODA or post CODA, why do you think that it still continues to be an issue? So I'm happy to pose it to each of you. Maybe I'll start with Leroy though, first since you're right next to me. Well, I, I think, I think, um, I think CODA is, is, um, it's not, it's not the first, you know, movie that won, you know, um, you can go back to Prudence, um, the musical Prudence that, that won um, a couple of years ago and sees a disabled um, African on, on, on Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So it, it's nothing new. I think, I think, I think what, what we need to do is that, just to tell the truth is that re re representation, we've always been there. You know, people with disabilities have always been there. So we don't want representation because we already have that. We, I, I think we should have um, this, this liberation, you know. You know, inclusion areas is okay, but we, we really want to say that, that, you know, institutions need to step up and do what they supposed to do since the eighties. You know, it's 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 law. It's the law. You know, so the thing the thing for me is that I'm not I'm not um I'm not Googleized with it's an inclusionary period. Because all these agencies had their time to do right. So it's it's so it's so funny because I see inclusion a nineteen eighty outreach. And here I worked in nonprofits and I thought I worked in nonprofits and we did outreach. It's it's almost the same thing. So my my thing is like just do, do your job and if you can't do your job, move out the way so we can do it for you. Because <laughs> I really think how Hollywood is dead. You know, we, we can do uh, movies on our phones. You know, I'm talking I'm talking to people in in, um, in in the Congo that's doing movies on their phones. So my my thing is uh, get out the way and let us do our work because we we've been doing it ever since. So yeah. Uh, if I may, I'm going to speak uh, about music and uh, deaf representation in terms of that industry, just because that's my, I'm so in dissertation brain right now. So that's going to be my uh, answer. But um, I think it's, music especially has this, uh, it creates this tension for non-deaf or, or hearing spaces because there's still this uh, mythologizing of the deaf body as being unable uh, to enjoy or experience music, right? Um, we know from scholars like Christine Sun Kim or artists uh, like Christine Sun Kim, whose work on sound has been um, formative and uh, that that is not true. Not to say that all deaf people even want to experience music, but um, I think that stereotyping has really limited or um, has dismissed the creation of spaces for um, deaf people to enter uh, into uh, the industry. Um, you know, just this past Super Bowl is when we had Wawa Snipes and uh, Sean Forbes. And even then, uh, even though it was great to sort of include them, they were, if you saw the <laughs> streaming, it was they were off on the side, like behind a goalpost. And um, they didn't realize that the streamed version was so dark and dim in terms of the lighting. Uh, so there's that. I also think um, 
I guess institutionally, uh, this may sound like a paradox perhaps, but there's a sort of obliviousness and a um, hesitation uh, in terms of, uh, well, hearing creative teams within the theater because uh, obliviousness in the sense that some people just don't realize how much time and labor and um, money it takes to, to put on collaborations. Um, and then the hesitation of those that do know how long it takes. Um, I, I have read and seen a lot of interviews from the Spring Awakening Deaf West uh, creative team members talking about just how massive the undertaking is, right? Um, the choreographer Spencer Liff has talked a lot about how, how much time the choreography takes. Um, and if you've seen the videos or if you got to see it uh, live, you can really see how integrated everything about deaf culture and sign language is into the show and into the movements and into the choreography. Um, but it takes a lot of labor. It takes a lot of money. Um, it takes a lot of time or what uh, some people call crip time or, or deaf time, right? And just thinking about how that changes the institution and, and perhaps still the institution is not ready to change. Um, so that's what, that, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. Um, well, um, uh, and perhaps echoing uh, Leroy as well is that this this question has been around since the 80s, since the early 80s, right? When I got to LA, the first thing I did there was a there, it was it was it was it was emerging in the unions. Um, there was a tri uh, tri union committee for performers performers with disabilities. Uh, SAG after, which were separate at that time, and equity, and the organ, the um, the fight within the union started in '80, and it's still going on, right? And it, you know, one way to look at it is as we go over the same ground all the time. People are always discovering us. Oh my gosh, your people! Wow, um, and oh, look at this great piece of art. Oh wow, um, so that kind of exotic exotic view of us um and then everybody wants to help you know oh this is terrible this is going on you know let's let's do something about it and then you get five years later you get the same phone call and um the same thing looking for people so that can get discouraging um on the other hand um uh there's progress being made and um for me a lot of because education was so important to me and because I was refused training, it's very, um, and, and I still feel the lack of that, though I've been doing theater for 40 years, right? Um, uh, that I think, and knowing how competitive the world is on every level, even if you're doing grassroots theater, it's, it's a struggle to be heard and to be included. Um, the, first, the first company, the first grant, I got from the California Arts Council, I heard that one of the committee members said to somebody, is she any good, right, you know? And, and they also said that about Ann Finger, who's one of our great, great um, novelists and prose writers, and same committee, I was on it, and they said, can she really do this? And luckily there was a professor from UCLA, I think an English professor who said, did you see this award she won? I don't remember what it was, but he says, that's one of the most prestigious boards you can get as a fiction writer. So there's this perception of, uh, of incompetency. And um, I'll talk about that later because I think it's one of the major things that keeps people from having careers um, uh, and training. So training is really important to me. I've written a, a fair amount about it and I did it for 10 years at the paper and I still do it. I'm a teacher, you know, that's what I've done most of my life. And I feel, um, uh, that opening those doors, but on, and Broadway isn't of course the be all and end all, but that there's been some major disabled actors working on Broadway, um, uh, which is pretty great. And there's many that I don't even know about that are doing it. So, and all, many of those people are coming out with degrees in theater. And I know that, you know, you don't, it's not a requirement but it is a place where you can learn and you can be with other uh, uh, um, uh, creators. Um, the other thing is to have something like um, uh, Sins Invalid, which sets up a group uh, with Patty Byrne and Leroy providing this incubus where 
all uh, everybody's welcome and then everybody can develop their work. And as you say, all of those things cost money, right? Even running a, a small, you know, a nonprofit is still a huge amount of work. And, uh, but that's, and that's what I felt I was uh, lucky to be part of at the taper that for 10 years and, and beyond 20 years, there was a place for people to come together and get rid of stigma management, which is one of my favorite terms, which is you're doing the song and dance to, to convince everybody that you're real, that you're, you're okay, that you're human too. Uh, Nancy Becker Kennedy is a, was a, one, is a wonderful stand-up sit-down comic. She said, I just, I used to tell them, I used to keep them laughing. I'd make them laugh so they wouldn't feel so sorry for me, right? So you're always negotiating, always doing that. So, but, but then when if you're a group of disabled people, not that we all agree to get along by any means, but that that's lifted. And so the creative and love and um, skills can, 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 blo can blossom in that environment. So I think there's a lot of change. I, I, um, um, for me, what I've experienced um, since the pandemic and since George Floyd is that a lot of institutions are, including disability as part of uh, marginalized communities. Um, not everybody does my own university. You know, the, the diversity statement that came out just a couple of years ago, disability is in there as other, right? <laughs> uh, uh, other unrepresented things. Um, so, um, but that's not what I find with young people. I when uh, at the university where the the heat is coming from in terms of disability justice, including disability discrimination, the issues of representation, that's coming from students. I think coming out of LGBT communities as well as a place that's open. I always found the opening from the women's movement that that's where disability studies came out of the rib, so to speak, of that. Um, uh, so I don't mean to waffle, but I, I do, um, and you know, just to be here makes me feel encouraged. Um, yeah. oh. I was excited to hear a lot about time in that, and also training, just leading up to this question that I prepared. <clears throat> Which really focuses on, uh, you know, what theater performance uh, can do for this question that Elizabeth started us off with. I failed to give my descriptor at the beginning. Uh, again, my name is Hans Vermeij. I'm a six foot tall, a white guy wearing a flat brimmed white hat and blue pants with a white and blue shirt. Here's my question for, for the panel. <clears throat> the social model of disability proposes that what makes someone disabled is not a medical condition, but the attitudes and structures and architecture of society. If performance contains as many have positive and championed the potential to rehearse and rebuild the world uh, the way that we desire it to be, how can we use theater and disability no, sorry, how can we use theater and performance to enact the social change within the social model of disability? Or another way to ask it, how can we use theater and performance to build a more inclusive future decentered from ableism? I'm gonna pass. <laughs> it, it, it's funny because I just wrote, wrote about this. Um, about the models of disability and you know I it it's interesting you know he talks about the social model of disability and I look at the social model of disability and once again it doesn't deal with racism. So I was like okay it, it's gone this far but we need Going back to what uh, Patty Burns said, that a disability justice model that deals with, you know, LGBTQ racism, you know, I said, so, you know, how, how does it look to have a disability justice model with a social justice model, you know, added to it in this area? And 
I think I think we just need to look at the the work that people are doing. Yeah, people are doing it right now. You know, so how how can we change it? Hmm. Bring Vendor into the in, 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 into the conversation. Poor magazine has been doing theater around poverty, disability and home and homelessness for years. So so the models are out there. I think universities and institutions need to get out there a little puzzle and reach out to these people and say, okay, you know, I know that disability justice is a key knowledge. Not it's not a theory. It's not it's not a, a, a you know a universal academic theory. But you know, the university can partner with Sending Out in Corn Magazine at their level and bring it to to university on theater. You know, I, I had this idea of doing the dozens around the history of the dozens and in disability. You know, that's that's an idea that I, I had that I hadn't seen in theater. You know, how can you see, you know, you see how I, you know, put put that out and do it. You know, so my other thing is it, it's out there now to partner with people that are doing it at their level. Um, I I uh, just I have an anecdote from the classes I just came from teaching, um, being a, a scholar in residence at Miami University Ohio, and one of the most honest things I've ever heard and 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 thoughtful uh, that I heard was a student who said, um, you know, the thing I had, and he has a disability studies minor, but he's wants to be a doctor. So one of those guys, right? Um, but he said that the hardest thing for him when he first got into disability studies was understanding the social model, that it just didn't make any sense from what he had been taught about disability from a child and growing up. It required him to really reset his, his mind. And I thought that was, it, it's really it's really hard to learn to think a different way and really hard to, to look at people a different way and to not and his and he um, he comes from, he came from a fundamentalist rich uh, religious background he has a brother who's autistic so I you know he came from, but but just to because of what I feel happens is that people just it's like when you're when you're typing and um, and the uh, audio typer just decides what you want to say and you know if you say um uh uh, uh coq de, coq vin, they say cocky girl right um because they go down and they reduce it um and uh, dr paul longmore who was one of the great um, theorists and historians and uh, uh leaders of the disability rights movement he founded the um, Paul Longmore Institute at, at uh, U, U, USC, no, um, S, S, F, never mind, I always get the initials wrong. Uh, the big one, the Catholic one up north. Um, and uh, so he wrote an op-ed and he said, and I said thinking that I'm a wheelchair user or, no, I don't think he said writer, that would be a little fancy for Paul. I think he said wheelchair user. And the editor at the at the LA Times changed it to wheelchair bound. That's what you're trying. That's what you should be saying, right? So um, I I think I think until we have uh, we're really working one on with peers, and that's one reason I think it's so important for people to be in the places where people go in these graduate programs in the undergraduate programs. Because when those people graduate and they're in theater and they go out and they make theater and they've never had anybody disabled on an equal level with them. It's always been somebody they probably felt I should be nice to, um, uh, et cetera. If they've never had that experience, well, then you're not gonna have, find a place at that table. And 
So what I think it's by working together in, in ensembles that a lot of the work can be done. And that's the way you, because, you know, how do I find out, you know, the, uh, how to behave? And I said, you know, the answer is you have to be with disabled people. You know, it's not something you can study. It's um, a lived experience. Everybody's different. Um, it's no one thing. So, um, uh, go ahead. Something quick. You know, we talk about money and resources, right? You know, and I, the, the, what happened at, at the Super Bowl, Super Bowl, that, that shit should not happen. They, they have all the money and all the resources. <laughs> You're talking about, you know, the, the Super Bowl is the biggest money making TV in, event in the world. See, and that, that should not happen. And we should not let them um, off the hook. You know, I, I understand that there was an opportunity and blah, blah, blah. But that that was disgusting. And the and the and the happen on a major scale like that, that that was truly they, they told us how they felt about deaf people on a national ID. And then another thing I wanna I wanna say closely, if you put up the picture of the ADA, I used to do this a lot. In the new picture of the Dakota movie, who's missing in this picture? Me, people of color. You know, 1991 and 2021. You know, what's where, where's the diversity in that? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just add to what what Leroy and uh, Vicky have been talking about, um, especially in terms of uh, training and starting from the, uh, I don't wanna say bottom up, but cl closer to the bottom up. Uh, I wanna talk about the top down, right? And thinking about theater spaces as um, making sure to include sort of a modeling of working with um, both disabled or deaf directors or designers or costumers or what what have you. I can't remember the specific um, show, but there's a original deaf musical, I think it's in Canada, um, where they talk about having this sort of associateship um, in which they had a primary deaf director, for instance, and then they brought on a hearing director um, or they had a hearing lighting designer and then they brought on a deaf lighting designer. And it's this uh, model of making sure to have uh, somebody who can speak to experiences of um, deaf and disabled people on the creative team, right? And so it's, for me, it's about thinking in terms of access and inclusion beyond just audience-based needs or beyond performer-based needs. I think that was one step. Um, but thinking more about creative team members and who's actually producing and creating and in charge of those works and, and spaces. Yeah, that's uh, just to, what I heard was some you know, comments about how beyond representation, we need to think about collaboration, who we're collaborating with, who we're partnering with, how institutions can partner and collaborate with some more people and, and really thinking about these training centers like universities taking those, those steps. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. And also just to pick up for those of you who are not familiar with it, the social model of disability, um, of course, posits that individuals who um, are um, impaired are actually disabled by society as opposed to looking upon their impairments just as medical, isolated medical conditions. Um, so we've heard about that. We've also heard about newer conversations about social justice being folded into this as Leroy is calling also for disability justice and the kind of opening out of questions of intersectionality within this also. Believe it or not, it is 12.31 and I feel like we just got started. So um, let's, take this moment to um, thank our panel and think about how we can get up to that 10% just for this moment. Thank you so much.
when you're looking at me, and I thought I was the oldest. 